right, hello and welcome to this DecisionWise webinar. My name is Charles Rogel. I'm the Vice President of Consulting Services and I'll be your host today. The title of our presentation is Employee Experience Trends for 2022. And our presenter today is Dave Long. Hello everybody. Dave is our Chief Operating Officer here at DecisionWise. Uh, we have a lot to cover, but a couple of things I want to touch on first. Um, of course, this is eligible for SHRM and HRCI credit, so one hour of, uh, of credits for each. Uh, after the webinar, I'll send an email um, with those codes so you can use those in the future when you log into your account. Your account. Um, this webinar is available. It will be recorded, and you can view it on demand on this Bright Talk channel. We won't be sharing the slides, so if you want to get access to those, you can just go back to the recording and, and look at those that you um, that you like. Um, if you have questions, please set those up or send those to us using the Bright Talk um, uh, you know toolbar, and we will try to answer those throughout our presentation. We'll probably save some till the end of the presentation. We will have a Q and A session. So um, we do want to encourage participation because we are curious to see what trends you all are seeing and how it kind of ties into our data today. So with that out of the way, Dave, do you want to kick us off and describe our agenda? Yeah, and I think maybe what we're hoping to do is, is take some of the information that we uh, have learned from some of the data that we've gathered from both internal decision-wise benchmarks and also some of the external research that we have seen regarding the employee experience um, and then and then also tie that to some of the things that Charles and I both work with quite a few clients um, on the employee experience side and so we're hoping to really get um, uh, we're hoping to get a little bit of uh, a perspective uh, from, from some of those conversations that we've had from with clients as well uh, as part of this but some things we'll be covering as I mentioned some benchmark trends from decision wise uh, benchmark uh, database stats from the uh, great resignation um, how many acts relates to culture employees uh, we're going to talk about employees as the most uh, important stakeholder uh, we want to talk about remote work and return, return to work and hybrid work considerations we'll also be talking about DEI and the employee experience and the importance of uh, belonging as we've seen it over the last few years in our database. So um, as we progress here, um, and maybe I'll set this up, Dave, and have you chime in. You know, as we've been talking to clients and, and uh, you know, debriefing employee survey results, and as they are, um, you know, as the, we're looking at the topics that were important to measure in 2020 as we were in the thick of the pandemic and then 2021 um, as we were kind of emerging or at least thinking we were going to emerge from the pandemic we saw um, these shifting concerns so the first thing in 2020 was of course safety on the top of everyone's mind how we keep our employees safe everyone most people that were office workers were working from home um, those that were, you know, in the office or uh, on the front lines, on the floor, whatever, working directly with customers, you know, what kind of safety policies and precautions do we have in place? And of course, in 2020, we saw a lot of civil unrest around topics around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so those, um, all of a sudden, we were measuring those topics more and more with our client. Before, we might have been measuring that with probably 10% of our clients, mainly those maybe in larger metro areas. In 2020, almost all of our clients started measuring this topic within their organizations. Communication became a priority. How do we communicate with people that are working from home or you know, in this different environment, keeping people safe? And then companies were concerned about productivity. How do we maintain levels of productivity um, where people are working from home or, or maybe um, you know, in a different working environment? And along with that collaboration, how can we keep teams uh, working effectively together when there's not a lot of interaction uh, locally? So then that shifted as we looked at last year. Um, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic, and people are starting to, you know, companies are starting to implement um, this work uh, from home policy. So what do we do? You know, everyone's thinking that um, we are. Uh, we're, uh, are we going to work remote permanently? Is there going to be a hybrid approach? And so people are navigating this space where we're saying, what do we do with our office workers? We think we want them to come back to work a few, at least a few days a week, but what's the right mix? 
Um, on top of that, we've got workload and stress. So the economy improved. Um, there's been supply chain issues. There's been staffing issues with retention, which is the third topic here. And so we're seeing that play out in employee survey results. BEI kind of is still important, but these other topics are kind of taking precedence. So we're still measuring this. Uh, there's committees in place. I wouldn't say it, it might have dropped. It's probably um, you know on par with these other things that are going on. But these are kind of the, the bigger concerns that companies are uh, dealing with. And then culture. What does our culture look like as we've been you know having this major shift in our workforce? And how do we be more deliberate about it and, and uh, measure it and define it going forward? So, Dave, anything you want to add there? Yeah, and I think the, the big question is, um, with, with that kind of a shift from 2020 to 2021, what are, the, what are the new things that we're going to see in 2022? I think a lot of the things, the concerns that we saw in 2021 are not going away. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about some of those things as we go through our, our presentation today. Perfect. And we are working on the audio quality, um, so we'll, uh, we'll continue adjust, making some adjustments as we go throughout. All right, so a few benchmark trends here. Um, Dave, do you want to talk to these, or how do you want to approach these slides? Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about them. Um, so we just pulled out some of, the, some, of the, uh, some of the data, and what we're doing is comparing 2020 to 2021, uh, just to kind of show you some of the trends. What we saw from 2019 until 2020, from the pre-pandemic pre pre to, to current day, all right, I, I think maybe, Charles, maybe it's best if you talk to it. Um, yeah, my, my, my audio, I still not good. Yeah, so we're measuring these. These are kind of the main questions we're asking on most of our employee surveys with clients around um, this topic of intent to stay, but there's some, several topics. So first of all, I'm confident that this organization has a successful future. It's interesting, um, as we looked at just data that we collected in 2020 versus 2021, when the pandemic set in in 2020, people were a little bit unsure. There were some layoffs in some organizations. Um, you know, it's still a relatively high score. 85% of people are agreeing with that statement. Um, but it increased in 2021. And I think a lot of that um, is dependent upon the increase in business that people are seeing, how busy we are. You know, a lot of people are hiring right now. And so they're seeing kind of a, uh, in 2021, they saw an even better outlook for the future. And that actually plays into people wanting to stay with an organization too. Um, second question is recommending this organization is a great place to work. It's relatively even year over year as we're looking at these, uh, these data points. And so what we found in 2020 is there was a lot of goodwill that was built up as people responded to the pandemic to help keep people safe. And so um, generally they would recommend it as a good place to work. Um, and we'll talk about some safety things here later on. Um, so a slight increase there. But then choosing to remain was surprising in our data in this question here where we're trying to get a beat on, um, you know, are people thinking that they're gonna remain with this organization? What's their future thought on retention? It stayed the same. So in 2020, uh, again, people kind of hunkered down a bit. They weren't quite sure the outlook for their organization. And, um, but in 2021, uh, we, we might have expected it to increase a bit. But again, we're seeing with the retention, you know, the great resignation occurring right now. I, I think some people are saying, I haven't really considered a job, but if a job came around with better paying benefits, of course I would consider that. So I choose to remain. But again, I, we're seeing a very competitive market where people are willing to, you know, uh, offer higher wages or benefits to attract talent. And that, is wouldn't be reflected in these scores that we're seeing here. Dave, any thoughts? Uh, no, I, I think that's uh, that's exactly the way I, I've seen it as well. Okay. Um, so a couple more data points here. We were really concerned about work-life balance. Now, these questions, it was interesting, the top two questions here about this organization encourages and promotes a reasonable balance between my work and personal life, and my job uh, allows me to maintain a healthy balance. Those weren't asked as frequently back in 2018 and 19, even in 2020. It's become a really important topic right now. So these questions are appearing on our surveys more frequently. Uh, because of this work from home um, uh, influence that we're seeing, work from home has really improved the work-life balance for people and they're seeing it and experiencing it. So you'll look at the second question there 
um, where we're seeing a six point increase in perceptions on this particular topic in 2021. The interesting thing, though, is that workload and stress um, perceptions on those topics have decreased. So 69 percent of people agreed with that statement around uh, the amount of work I'm expected to do is reasonable in 2021. And we also saw a three point dip around the level of stress is manageable. This is not only office workers, but also frontline workers um, or people working on the shop floor, warehouse, wherever. If they're if they're out of facility, um, staffing's an issue, and so they're picking up a lot of the extra workload and stress. Um, so it's funny that work-life balance has improved a bit for people mostly working from home or with a hybrid work environment, but uh, workload and stress has increased. Even people working from home are. Um, some are reporting that they are working more hours just because they're always plugged in. But the workload and stress numbers are were worse prior or were, were better than this prior to the pandemic. So in 2019, they were slightly higher than this. And so we've seen uh, we've seen a couple of consecutive years where workload and stress is really is really starting to take center stage in a lot of in a lot of the surveys that we're running with organizations. Yep, that's a good point. Um, and so here's where we start getting into understanding diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. You know, I feel like I belong here being that statement that we've measured a lot. So these questions again became a lot more important in 2020. Um, we were gathering data on that third question there, creating an inclusive environment as a top priority for this organization. So we didn't have a benchmark or enough data in the benchmark to show in 2020. We do in 2021. The good news is these questions are doing pretty well. And so especially as we're looking at this increase, you know, two point increase around people feeling like they were uh, treated equally. Um, you know, this organization attracting and retaining people of diverse backgrounds dipped two points. But usually, you know, the, these differences are relatively nominal overall as we're looking at these results. And then this feeling like I belong here dipped slightly, only a one point dip. And that was a big concern for a lot of organizations feeling like, uh, you know, we're working from home, we're less connected with each other. Uh, you know, we maintain this culture, a sense of belonging, and that, um, you know, stayed relatively the same. Um, and then a breakout here we did find very interesting was if we look at this question about employees being treated equally regardless of race, ethnicity, age, and so on, the Black or African American populations and organizations, their perceptions were lower. So 78% of this population agreed with this statement. They either said agree or strongly agree compared to the other larger race or ethnicity categories that we have here. Um, so that was a, a large difference that we saw in most organizations and that perception about being treated equally does play out and is on their on you know top of mind. So this is something I think um, to consider and as you have your your DEI committees understanding what equality meet, uh, means or equity means across your organization for different populations um, is something to focus on. Dave, anything on, on these slides you want to comment on? Yeah, I guess I, I was a little surprised, you know, as we were going through the data to see, you know, pretty consistent uh, responses to this across most populations. That, that, that is a significant difference between uh, the African-American population and the other uh, populations. So it's something to keep an eye on in every organization um, to, to understand kind of the impacts of your culture on these specific groups and, and more and more this is a demographic that we're including um, i would say five years ago we included this on maybe 15 20 percent of the surveys that we did and, and, and these days we're doing it on uh, far more than that yeah and it's one of the topics you know usually as we're looking at demographic or, or um, comparisons across race and ethnicity on employee survey results there's other topics that start emerging or differing um, between groups. And so this is one of those areas, but you know, we look at employee voice, we look at this sense of belonging and other things, and it does vary across organizations, but this one's standing out, which we, which we found surprising. All right, so now culture is, is one of the topics, you know, everyone's kind of concerned, um, you know, what is our culture doing? Is it changing? Are we losing it? Um, how are, people uh, perceiving our culture. Now, 
the surprising data point here, you know, 2020, most people, again, working from home as well as 2020, 2021, but we saw an improvement. So people, again, feeling comfortable in the culture, which is somewhat surprising because I remember, you know, I talked to a lot of people and some are saying, hey, I got hired during the pandemic. I haven't even met face to face with my team in a live setting yet. It's all been remote and virtual. Um, so it's good to see that people's perceptions about culture in the organization is doing well. We started asking this question about, I can be myself at work and have enough data now in 2021 to show this about being authentic. And then feeling cared about was relatively even. Um, the care question is interesting because it does tie into how you're handling the pandemic. And if people feel like there are fair and equitable policies being implemented around that, and if we're concerned for people's safety, um, and those are you know maintaining the same. A little bit of volatility uh, comes in around the, you know, getting people back to the office um, policies because we you so, do see that as a major disruptor. And so I have seen this score differently in organizations that are kind of in the midst of that, um, that rollout. Dave, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think that's I think that's right on in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the impacts of work from home. How is that going to impact culture? And that's something that I think we really want to emphasize as we talk through this today. And then, um, you know, collaboration ties in here too. So people are more concerned, oh, we're gonna work from home, everything's gone virtual. Are we gonna lose uh, the ability to collaborate and, and work together? The surprising finding here is that this difficult question that we ask, we work effectively across departments and functions, typically it scores lower, like uh, we've seen it at like 55% in our benchmark, 55% agreement on that statement has increased. And this has been a surprising finding in our data um, and, and maybe it's because we've been more deliberate, you know, with these teams meetings or whatever, however we're conducting meetings virtually, um, that has been uh, effective. And even at the team level, when we look at people on my team collaborating and taking accountability for results, those are still high scores over the past two years. And so um, that has uh, been a bit of good news. Yeah, we, we've, um, we've long, for a long time, worked on, we work effectively across departments and functions with organizations. In fact, um, you know, it used to be uh, in the mid-50s uh, in terms of favorable percentage prior to 2020. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it took a big bump after the pandemic. I think that people were really figuring out how to collaborate and they had to be a little more deliberate about it and we see that i was really surprised to see that continue to tick up along with other communication measures and we'll look at that as well but for that to continue to tick up in 2021 was really interesting yeah and that, that ties into communication so the the good news we saw as a pandemic setting is there was a flurry of communication like weekly calls video uh, calls with the executive team and so there's a lot more exposure from senior leadership to the general population of the company, which uh, improved uh, communication quite a bit. So supervisor communication improved, even though they were managing virtual teams in many cases. But this middle question, the organization communicates well with all employees about what's going on. We saw a dramatic improvement in that particular statement before. And I think, Dave, that was sitting at about 56% favorable in 2018 and 2019. And so it has really improved and continues to score higher uh, compared to what we've seen before. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, that is hard to explain, except for you, you look at these individual organizations and see some of the things that they've done. And, and I think it's really just been, you know, the pandemic has forced people, organizations to be deliberate about the way they communicate. Like you said, with those weekly, a lot of organizations have instituted weekly uh, uh, meetings and, and updates and things like that. And, and uh, you know, one of my colleagues has even uh, suggested, well, during the pandemic, when you're working from home uh, because you're remote. Uh, you, you tend to listen a little more in those meetings as well. So maybe information that was communicated previously but not heard is being heard a little bit better by those people that are not in an office every day and they're in that communication as it comes to them. Yeah. So, uh, so keep it up, everyone. Don't let your foot off the communication pedal because it is paying off. We see it pay off in a variety of different ways in terms of just positive perceptions about the organization, the direction, and senior leadership in general. 
Okay, um, so let's put some of this into perspective as we talk about the great resignation. Transitioning here to say, what about turnover? What about um, attrition? Here's some of the stats, Dave, that you were looking up around the U.S. Uh, from the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Yeah, let's, let's talk about it really quick. I, I just think it's interesting to note that um, in 2021, we had the 10 highest turnover months uh, since 2001. And the study that I looked at only went back to 2001. I would be surprised if these weren't some of the highest turnover record, uh, months on record. So 10 of the 12 months of 2021 were, were 10 of the highest on uh, record. The highest turnover month was in November of 2021. So that was for the end of the year. So it was still peaking for the end of the year. It went down a little bit in December. But I would think we would expect high numbers as well. 4.5 million people left their jobs voluntarily in uh, in November of 2021. Uh, prior to 2021, the highest number to quit in a month was just over 3.5 million. And the funny thing is that record was set in January of 2020. So it was right before right before the pandemic. This trend was already starting. Um, but uh, but you know, as the pandemic hit, and people, there was a period of time where people were really holding on to their jobs as much as they possibly could, and then we get to the end of uh, 2020 and into 2021, and this great resignation really started. So in total, in 2021, there were eight months where we saw more than 4 million people quit. So this is really uh, something that's impacting, I think, not only uh, you know, individuals that are individual organizations on the micro level, I think it's impacting uh, the economy on a macro level, and I think it has something to do with some of the supply chain problems and, and worker shortage problems and everything that we're seeing that's maybe leading to uh, workload stress and has significant impacts on the people uh, that are working for you. Yeah. And I think everyone's feeling it, and this puts some numbers to how, how pervasive it is across the, at least the United States um, in terms of staffing right now. So then, um, you know, this is, this is where we're looking at knowledge workers, office workers, and this kind of work from home concept and this kind of great perk that we've had during the pandemic. Now, now what does it turn into? Are we able to maintain this? Um, yeah, here we have, and, and I think a lot of the question is what do we do with our knowledge workers going forward? Yeah. Uh, office staff, people who uh, really work at a computer and can really work from anywhere. Um, what we're seeing is that knowledge workers can uh, have, have more options right now because they can work from anywhere, they can do their job from any location. Uh, they're not tied to a geographic place. So that means uh, with a mobile only position, they can move in where they want. Um, they don't need to be located close to the office like it's been in, really even pre pandemic. For most organizations, you had to have people that were in the geographic area. But that also means that companies can recruit from anywhere. So a company in, uh, if you are a company in Iowa, a company in California can come in and, and steal your talent, and that person that they take doesn't even have to move from Iowa. They can work, they can work for a company in California from Iowa. So the constant complication of recruiting out of state or even out of country has reduced significantly for companies, which just makes the war for talent, particularly for knowledge workers who can do their work from anywhere, just more intense than it's ever been. Yeah, and so this has kind of been a major disruptor, and we're seeing this, you know, the dust hasn't settled yet. This is still up in the air and creating a lot of um, disruption right now in the marketplace. And those that can capitalize on this will do well, and those that don't, <laughs> not so well. And we'll, we'll talk to that here in a minute. Um, so let me kind of describe some of these definitions. You know, we've been, we've been throwing some of these terms around as we're measuring these different topics, but... There's kind of a hierarchy here. So when we talk about culture, you can see we're talking about kind of a set of values, norms, guiding beliefs, you know, general terms here. But essentially, it's the way we do things around here. And what it really helps us to do is how to make decisions. So if we understand the culture and the way we do things, then me as a frontline worker, I know how to interact with customers better. I know how to make decisions. And, and so it helps to um, kind of formal, not formalize, but informally um, create um, a, a good dynamic or hopefully a good dynamic around how we get things done. 
The second piece is the employee experience. And so this is really the sum of all the perceptions that we have as an employee and our interactions with um, kind of in how we work. Um, essentially the impact of the culture on employees. And then finally that um, uh, results in employee engagement or at least drives employee engagement. So the state where we feel passionate and energetic about our work um, employee, so we would say the employee's emotional response to the employee experience. So if we create a good experience, people can choose to engage in that environment. They still have some ownership over their engagement, but we're trying to create this fertile ground where people uh, can do their best work and be engaged in their job. And I think uh, one of the points of confusion that we have a lot and we need to clear up a lot when we're working with organizations is, is that uh, sometimes when we think about culture, we think about it in the same light as employee experience. What does it feel like to work in an organization as an employee? That really is, it's one slice of culture. It is employee experience is just how the employees are or the impact of the culture on the employees. So when we're working on the employee experience, um, we need to understand that and trying to build engagement in the organization, we need to understand that engagement is an outcome of employee experience and that employee experience is an outcome of organizational culture. So for us to impact employee experience and ultimately engage our employees more, we have to change cultures or, or we must change in other words to make it more simple the way we do things around here and how that impacts employees and that's really how we can think about culture change as we're uh as we're getting into uh as we're getting into this discussion let me, let me just say this first of all organizational culture we think about it especially as hr people we think about it in terms of well this is what is the impact on employees and that's important but organizational culture, the way we do things around here is going to impact how the organization treats customers, how it treats shareholders, how it treats the community around it, and employees. there's not just one singular stakeholder of the culture of an organization. There are multiple stakeholders. What makes employees unique is that if, you, if the employees experience the culture in a positive way or a negative way, uh, but if they experience it in a positive way, they're likely then to improve the experience of customers, improve the outcomes for shareholders, and improve um, the organization's interaction with the community. Whereas if they experience the culture poorly, if they don't, if they, they, their experience is poor in the organization's culture, then outcomes for customers, employee-driven outcomes for customers, shareholders, and the community worsen. So it makes employees, even though we have multiple stakeholders for organizational culture, it makes these employees a more critical stakeholder because they're really going to drive the outcomes of all stakeholders. Uh, in the organization. So that's why we focus so heavily. When we talk about culture, we do this heavy focus on, on what's the cultural impact on employees and trying to understand that because it really, the employees really drive all the outcomes that we're looking for as a business. Yeah, those are ambassadors of the culture. So let's talk about some of the specific things that we've that we've seen in the employee experience. One of them is uh, remote and hybrid work, and, and and the impact that has. We've got some statistics here that we're going to run through. This is not our own research. We're giving credit at the bottom of each of these where we found all of these. This is from the Pew Research Center. But Charles, you want to talk about uh, some of the things we found here? Yeah, these are really interesting. And so you can see the first question here: Working from home has made it. Um, harder to balance work and personal life, only 16% uh, you know, uh, replied that, or easier to balance work and personal life, 64% um, stating that when answering that question, 20% about the same. So, um, so we see work-life balance as a significant uh, benefit or outcome to working from home. And then um, as we're looking at connection to coworkers though, that's where we see the drop. So working from home has made uh, them feel less connected to coworkers. 60% responded that way. Only 4% said more connected. And 36% though, about the same. So um, again, maybe the introverts out there are saying, no, <laughs> I'm getting the same amount of interaction I've always wanted. Um, but yeah, this connection piece is, um, is the trade-off. And so how do we kind of, uh, how important is connection is one question. Uh, how compared to work-life balance and productivity, 
Um, and so that's the dilemma uh, that we're trying to navigate and figure out as we implement these new hybrid work policies. Um, I'll talk to this one, I guess, Dave, uh, slide 21, the purpose of an office. This was some other interesting research from the same study from PwC. Um, you know, when we ask employees why, you know, what they value in, in their office space, um, or sorry, employers, uh, they would say it's about productivity and a, a, a space to meet with clients, enabling them to collaborate, and then enabling our company culture. And so employers, you know, definitely like to see uh, butts and seats, right? We like to see cars out in the parking lot. That means we're busy, working together, productive. But employees look at it more as for collaborating um, or getting access to equipment or documents, meeting with clients, a third, and then training and career development, fourth. So entirely, it's funny, it's entirely different in terms of perspective that employers and employees have about the purpose of an office. Um, Dave, anything else you want to add there? Yeah, I think that's important to know, um, you know, the difference between how an employee sees an office. Like if you just look at the number one uh, thing that employees say, you know, the biggest purpose to have an office or to have a space to gather is for collaboration. Um, and employers, it's a sort of low trust assumption that people aren't going to be productive if they're not working from the office. That's going to have to be something I think that changes over time. Uh, that, that perspective of, well, you have to be in the office to increase productivity. Um, that's going to have to. That's going to have to be a perception that's changed over time. Most of workers out there, whether you agree with this or not, most workers that have been working remote over the last uh, two years are right now saying I've been as productive as I've ever been. Now you maybe agree with that, maybe you don't agree with it, or maybe you will believe it when you see it, you can't see it because they're working from home. I don't know, but but that's the view of most employees is that, hey, listen, I've delivered while working from home and therefore I've built the trust necessary to have the right to be able to do that on a more regular basis. Yeah, and, and I think the downside is there's too much collaboration, right? Too many interruptions, disruptions working in the office. If you're working from home, you can concentrate and get things done. That's true. Um, so remote work has been a success. So when we ask employers this statement, 83% says it's been say it's been successful uh, compared to employees, where 71% say that it's been successful. I thought this was really interesting. I always would see that would be flipped. Um, so, so even employers would say, yeah, it's successful working from home. And then employees are saying, well, then why do you want us back in the office? <laughs> so that's the dilemma right now. 23% um, uh, mixed results uh, from employees. That's another interesting stat there where, yeah, it, it's good in some cases, maybe not so good in others. And then the ideal work arrangement, um, this one I, I think we thought was uh, really interesting. So, um, you know, 29% saying uh, five days a week, uh, let's say, I think, but 71% uh, prefer to either not work remotely or some sort of hybrid arrangement. And so again, you know, I think we've been concerned because we've heard voices saying, why can't we always be remote? And we're assuming everyone feels that way. Well, this data, um, it, you know, says otherwise. Dave, anything here? You want to yeah, add? I mean, uh, yeah, 29% of people saying I would work, I want to work every single day in the office. And then most people, if you look at this, only 8% of people say, well, I don't want to work them our way. Mm -hmm. But most people fall somewhere in between, uh, where you know, we could say like 63% of everybody falls into this category where they're saying, well, I would really like some sort of hybrid arrangement. Um, and I think it's because, and we'll, we'll talk more about this as we kind of get into to what we've seen, you know, as we work with organizations. But one of the things that, one of the things that I've seen is that, uh, that one of the most valuable parts uh, pre-pandemic for people about their work life and, 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 and one of the reasons why they, they want to work, why they want to go to, to work every day, is the social interactions that they get to have. And so just saying, well, we're not gonna have an office anymore, 
uh, we'll just shut down the offices and everybody works from home. May not be the ideal thing. It will work for you know probably twenty nine percent of your people. For but for everybody else, they want to have a physical touch point, um, at least one day a week of a physical touch point. So it's it's an interesting thing to see uh, this that that it's not the majority of people who are saying they want to work every day remote. And another, um, another more recent stat as we're looking at this, so Boston.com did a reader's poll, so it's not, I wouldn't place it as high as maybe a, you know, a more extensive poll from the PwC or another uh, Pew Research Center. But it is interesting data because it's more recent. This was just taken at the beginning of March 2022. Um, and, you know, a remote work preference, 65%, hybrid, 30% back to the office 5%. So again, you know, we saw 30% in the PWC study, 29% said remote full time. Uh, here only 30% are saying remote or hybrid comparatively. So, you know, we're seeing, you know, this is still settling. We're not quite seeing or, or under or know for sure the mix and it will depend on your workforce and type of work as well. It should be noted that that was more of a regional, like you said, readers poll um, for, for Boston. Yeah, exactly. So it's not, I would say it's probably more regional than anything else. And you'll have to understand what's going on in your own workforce and what they want. All right, so here's some of the impacts on remote work. Maybe you want to run through Yeah, um, you know, I think we need to understand the balance between these two sides. Um, on, the, on the individual side, um, the implication of remote work is that if I'm an individual, the market for jobs that I can go out and get becomes much larger. Um, I'm valuing as an individual a high degree of flexibility to do things, uh, you know, kind of when I want to throughout the day, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, if I need to run to a dentist appointment, I don't need to make a big deal out of that, I can just do it. But it's also, especially those who were hired um, post March 2020. Anybody who's been hired within the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the pandemic, it's been difficult for those folks to assimilate into the culture. Um, they, they've never, some of them have never met their colleagues in person, some of you, some of the people listening may have experienced some of this, but it, we've seen difficulties for them to really assimilate into the culture. And one of the biggest things that are missing from the culture is the day-to-day -day connection with team members. That's been lacking. That's been historically, you know, we go back to the 90s of, of doing employee surveys. Historically, the biggest thing that people value about their job is their connection with team workers, with teammates. And so we, we want to, um, that is something that we want to make sure as we go forward, if we are doing remote work, that's something that we're preserving. Also, something, some feedback I think seems from people that are, that are uh, working from home is it feels like instead of it's like, instead of work from home, it feels like I live at work. Um, you know, I'm always in the office because my home is my office, um, and and that maybe sometimes pulls me. It's hard to draw the line between what's my personal life and what's my professional life because I get pulled away during my work day for personal things, and I get pulled away during my personal day for work things, and the, the line continues to blur when I'm working only remote between my work and personal life. So that's an interesting insight that we've heard from people. On the organization side, and, and whether the organization is willing to take advantage of this or not, the reality is your hiring pool is expanded if you're willing to offer remote work. If you can, if you are a business in Arizona and you can hire someone in Minnesota to do your work, then to do work in your organization, then you have a much higher uh, or much larger talent pool to draw from. Um, you may, if a lot of people are working remote, uh, be able to save some costs in office space, reduce that. Um, might be difficult to do with hybrid work, but that's that's a possibility. Um, I would say that organizations are worried about establishing a consistent culture where people are, remember the def definition that we had um, of culture. One of the things is we, we see and understand how other people act and behave and therefore we act and behave the same way. If, if we're not able to see that in an, in an organic way, 
then how do we make sure people understand what is our culture? Do we have to be more deliberate about teaching that to new members as they join? And then difficult to monitor employees' work. Um, you know, that, that's something we remember we looked at what is what is an organization think is the purpose of an office. One of the things they said was increased productivity. Um, that's this is a concern. This is not this is not a something to sweep under the rug. We do want to be able to understand productivity measures, efficiency measures, quality measures of people that are uh, working remotely. If we can't see it every day, that's not so, that's not a concern that we want to just say, well, that doesn't matter. It absolutely does matter uh, for, for uh, you know, the well-being of your business. Um, and, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, organization, if, if we can't have kind of the organic, everyday collisions between managers and, and direct reports, we need to create more formalized feedback uh, mechanisms. And that's also true for employee voice. When people, how, how are people able to share, uh, you know, their experience with the organization? If they're not there every day and they're not talking about it every day, they need more and more opportunities to share their voice with the organization as well. So um, and maybe I'll, I'll run through these, Dave, and have you comment on, on uh, some insights here. But um, as we're looking at this, so balances, you know, basically added autonomy while still allowing for organic team connections. So how do we, what's the, how do we strike that right balance where we're still able to interact with our team, but uh, work remotely or flexibly? Um, maybe it doesn't provide all the flexibility employees are looking for, so it will be hard to kind of meet everyone's needs or kind of hit that right mix. And there will be an adjustment period. So people's expectations are kind of offset right now. And once we kind of establish a new norm, then people tend to adapt and recalibrate, so to speak, and their happiness improves. Um, it, sometimes for organizations, it's difficult to reduce office space. You know, we bought it. It's hard. Maybe it's harder to lease out some of that space. So. Uh, we've got that on our hands. And then, um, but the upside is, you know, we have established tools and resources to support remote work, you know. Uh, so it was surprising how quickly we adapted to working remotely and had the tools we needed to get it done. Um, what else, Dave? Anything? You want to add? Yeah, I mean, if you're hybrid, then that means that we're, we're keeping an office open for people to work within that office you know, not five days a week. Yeah. And so um, you may think about and something that a trend that we're seeing, for example, is more hotel offices, hotel cubicles, uh, to be able to rotate people through, um, you know, because not everybody's going to work there at the same time uh, during the week. But if you're hybrid, then, you know, having options for somebody to be able to come in that has an important client call, for example, to be able to have an office that they can come and hotel in for the day. Um, could be could be one way to kind of get around just having the same, you know, each person gets their own space. Now we have kind of more hotel spaces available within the office. Great. You want to talk to these? Yeah, um, I mean, just we've talked about this at length already, but return to work considerations. Um, if you are going to require your employees to return to work, understand that one of the things that they're going to notice immediately is their flexibility is greatly diminished. Some, uh, some employees might view that, uh, you requiring them to return to work as though they have had a perk or a benefit taken away. And this can be a major thing for some employees. Uh, we have worked with some organizations, many organizations, where employees during the pandemic actually moved away. And all those workers that work on the computer and can use the internet to do all their work, they moved to a different geographic location. And so, and so now what do we do with those employees? Um, it's, it's a huge problem for some of the organizations, especially uh, organizations that operate in areas where the cost of living is particularly high. You know, people saw the opportunity to leave uh, some of those kind of uh, you know, high cost of living uh, uh, places and to go to other places that don't cost as much. Uh, but now, you know, some of those organizations are wanting people to return to the office and maybe they want to return to the office in Seattle, but they live in North Carolina. So there's there's that complication as well, um, but also um, you know uh, one of the nice things about return to work is we can kind of go back 
to the status quo that we had pre-pandemic. Now, a lot of people were comfortable with that status quo, but it didn't always deliver the best results. So even if you think, well, let's go back to the status quo where everybody's here, where everybody just learns their culture organically, and gets communication organically, you still want to take what have we learned from the pandemic in terms of how we communicate to employees and how do we make sure we don't drop the ball on that as we move forward because there are, there are some significant gains that have been had across almost every organization and the way that you communicate, the way that you collaborate across departments that we don't want to lose just because we fall into the old habits of, of what it's like to work uh, to work in the office. Yeah, and I think one theme here people are saying is lack of trust. In other words, if you're, if you're going to force us in the office five days a week, well, that means you don't trust us to work from home. And we already proved that we could work from home. So why the lack of trust is how people perceive that. Um, so let's kind of talk about how do we get at these and understand these issues so we can really make some decisions locally within our organization. And, you know, of course, if we do employee surveys, there's there's the annual survey, but there's several other ways to gather feedback to understand. The yeah, yeah, and I, I think this is a trend that we're definitely seeing. Uh, we're saying this is a trend for 2022, but honestly, this trend has been developing. Uh, and really became more rapid after the pandemic hit, but it was already kind of coming into play pre-pandemic. And so uh, organizations are starting to think about what, what is our whole listening strategy? Many organizations are saying, well, a once a year survey is not robust enough for us to understand the full employee experience. One of the cool things about having a good listening program for your employees, it doesn't just have to be surveys. There's many ways that you can listen to your employees. But a good listening strategy should inform an effective employee value proposition. It's one of the things that I think we need to think about as we, uh, as we look to retain and attract the talent. What is our value proposition? What are the things that are really great about our culture that we can sell to new employees and that will help us retain existing employees? And what are the toxic parts of our, of our culture, the toxic managers or policies or procedures that we have? And the best way to find that out is to get the um, impressions and uh, perceptions of employees who are living within that culture. So uh, really important to think about how do we gather those perceptions of employees so we can identify quickly the toxic parts of our culture, whether that be a, a bad manager or, or just a bad policy somewhere, uh, procedure somewhere, uh, the bad technology <laughs> that we're using. What are those things that are part of our culture and part, part of the value proposition that we're offering to employees that are either driving people away or keeping them there? Um, and then we use that value proposition to go out there and attract new talent as well. So I think some strategy is really important. Uh, something that we've seen kind of implemented as a, as a life cycle sort of listening strategy is you, you still have an engagement survey, possibly a pulse survey, built into your listening strategy, but you also have um, your other employee touch points. For example, some of the first hire to talk about what was your interview process like, uh, what were your first you know, 10, 15, 20 days um, on the job like, what was your experience like, did you get everything that you needed in that? And then after the onboarding is completed at the 90 day mark, maybe they'll do an onboarding survey just to make sure that hey, you feel enabled to do your job, you have the tools, equipment, training, you need to do your job and get productive with your job. And secondly, do you feel like you want to do your job? Do you feel engaged to do the work that you're doing in that onboarding survey? And then to give them more frequent touch points. So maybe you send out a, a, a survey on their anniversary to say, hey, tell me about the last year of work here. And then also for, for those, those people leaving the organization to give their impressions about why you're leaving. Um, I can tell you right now, a lot of people are leaving. Uh, the biggest reason we see people leaving organizations right now is to find you know, more opportunity in terms of growth opportunity somewhere else or more money somewhere else. Uh, but for you to understand why are people leaving your organization so you can kind of look at that and say, is there a way for us to adjust uh, the value proposition we're offering employees in order to keep them here longer? So this is kind of a more typical or, or becoming more of the norm that you're measuring in different parts of the employee life cycle, that you're, uh, that you're gathering more frequent feedback and you're looking at specific events or, or, or uh, landmarks in a person's tenure with the organization to try to understand, so what's your experience now? We can adjust the employee experience. We can adjust the value proposition from there. 
Good point. Nothing yet on my end. So I guess uh, let's transition here and talk about some of these other ways to approach in these topics we've been bringing up. So when we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, here's some of the trends that we're seeing around this topic. Uh, so Dave, do you want to address these as well? Yeah, I think before the pandemic, um, you know, we have always offered diversity, equity, and inclusion questions as part of our survey. Um, you know, prior, you know, well in advance of the pandemic, we have had a model that we've been working from for DEI, um, but we haven't always been able been successful in getting organizations to uh, include DEI related or specific, really explicitly ask about DEI policies in their employee experience surveys. Uh, that was maybe 10 or 15 percent of people prior to 2020, and now that percentage is definitely exceeds more than half of the organizations that we work with are asking explicitly about DEI practices in their organization surveys. Um, I would say that employees are demanding that their organizations take an explicit stance on DEI. That doesn't need to be an external stance on DEI, although I think there are some employee populations that do want their organization to take an external, like, uh, out, outward facing stance on DEI. Um, but they, they certainly, at a minimum, want to make sure that the organization is serious about uh, DEI, making sure that everybody has the same opportunity uh, as the person next to them for advancement, to be able to speak up, uh, to be able to feel like a part of the culture and feel cared for by the organization, to feel closeness with their manager or, or have a, 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 a consistent relationship with manager they want to make sure that their organizations are committed to that um, and then I would say uh, as we would say with just about everything you know we're a survey company obviously we, we uh, advocate for surveys but surveys are not the only way to measure our organization's commitment to DBI and, and they might be uh, you know Further to forth in terms of effectiveness. So, you want know, like, to understand people's individual experience, but you also want to be able to look at the demographics of the company and say, you know, look at the demographics of the company and say, can we see from the demographics of the company that you're committed to DEI? You know, some actions in, in many cases are uh, more impactful than words, especially when it comes to this DEI uh, topic. Uh, one of the things that we, um, I, I mentioned that we've, we've been measuring for DEI for a while now, uh, we use these constructs uh, to try to understand diversity, equity, and inclusion. We will ask, in our employee surveys, we'll ask implicit things that say, you know, are, are these things a part of your experience? And we'll look at this across different demographics. So we'll look at it against gender demographics or uh, race or ethnicity gen demographics. So do people feel like they have growth opportunities? Do they feel like they have a voice, the ability to speak up, or do they feel like when they do speak up that their voice is valued by the organization? And then the third one is, do they feel like they belong here? We're not asking these questions to say, you know, as a diverse person, do you feel like you belong here? We're just saying, do you feel like you belong here? And we'll allow people to kind of judge that, um, you know, for their, from their own experience. And then after we ask that question, we overlay uh, the DEI metrics to see, okay, are there, are there specific groups within the organization that are having a worse experience than others in terms of growth and voice and belonging? I highlighted belonging because we're going to come back to that. It's become such an important part of our research that I just want to make sure that we highlight that. Um, and, and when we talk about Transfer 2022, belonging is one of those things that you want to kind of highlight, check mark, circle, and underline because it's something that you're going to want to look at in your own organization to see how are we fostering belonging in our organization, especially if you plan to go forward with a work from home or a remote work policy. You want to understand if we're going to do that, how are we going to also foster belonging with those people? So I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Explicit measures of DEI uh, would be survey items. I'm going to include in a survey that explicitly call out diversity, equity, inclusion efforts in the organization. We call that organizational commitment to DEI. So uh, one thing we're asking is, what's your experience like? 
We're not framing that in terms of as an inverse cosine or as whatever. What we're, the second thing we're asking is, okay, but what do you think is the organization's commitment to this? And those are some of those questions that we asked that we showed you at the very beginning of this webinar, um, you know, uh, that, that specifically call out and ask about the commitment that the organization has to promoting and hiring and developing people with diverse backgrounds. Um, to the organization's overall commitment to DEI, you know, all of those things are, are things that we um, that we uh, that we want to understand, um, and, and it's one of the things that is that we we'll often see some disagreement uh, along racial um, demographics or along gender demographics, and so it's something we want to pay attention to um, as we as we are measuring for DEI in the organization. I, I, I wanted to come back to the importance of belonging. Um, I, I'm just going to say this and, and take it for what you want. Um, uh, the top driver of engagement in our database, in the decision wise database, for the last five years has been I feel like I belong here. That's the survey item. It's I feel like I belong here. Uh, so if you can if, if you can get people to agree to the statement, I feel like I belong here, you are far more likely to have that person engage in the culture and stay with you for over a long period of time. If they feel like they belong here, it's really hard to get that person to leave the organization. Um, so we have to look at what are some of the factors that influence belonging. One is that they feel like their voice is valued by the organization. The second is that they feel cared for by the organization. And the third thing is they align with the purpose and direction of the organization. So uh, those are the biggest factors that we see related to belonging. So if they feel like they have a voice, they feel cared for by the organization, and they feel like their, their purpose aligns with what their reason for living kind of aligns with the organization they work with, then all of these things will add up to um, them feeling like they belong there. Now, there are other factors, and certainly one of those factors is, do I feel camaraderie with the team that I work with? Um, and, and that goes into whether or not I feel cared for by the organization or the people around me. So there's things that you can look at and tweak within the organization to really help you with that, uh, that feeling of belonging. Good points. Yeah, so let's kind of summarize here and, and talk about the items to focus on in 2022. So if we were to say what five areas should you work on, you know, here they are. And we've, we've touched on these already a bit. Uh, we added a couple more to the list here. But, um, you know, as you're trying to retain, engage, um, you know, create a, a productive workforce. Um, we're seeing these as your top five employee experience um, areas. Dave, you want to address these? Or some of these? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything we've been saying, we know that there are pros and cons for remote work and hybrid work arrangements. I think Charles and I would both agree the organizations that are best able to figure out how to balance remote work and hybrid work with all the concerns that we have about it, about culture building and team connection and all those things that we talked about. Um, I think those are the organizations that are going to win the work for talent, especially when we talk about knowledge workers. Now, yeah. um, Charles and I have talked you know, privately about, well, there's different situations for if you work in a factory or if you work you know, the front lines of, of a restaurant or if you work so, you know, but, but for knowledge workers, I think the organizations are going to figure out the right hybrid work, work arrangements. They're going to win the work for talent. Yeah, and people are really looking for kind of equity here, too. So if they feel like a certain population gets better, uh, has better ability to work from home compared to others for no reason. They're, they're very sensitive to that right now. So you have to be careful how you roll this out and promote it. That is very true. Um, one of the things that we need to be aware of, just because we've seen the exit surveys, people are leaving a uh, dollar more per hour. Um, they will leave the organizations. So there's a lot of weight sensitivity. And, and it's mostly because there's a lot of opportunity out there, but there's also inflation. Um, so looking at your current population and they're saying, hey, if you didn't give them a raise of at least 8% over the last year, that's a big raise. But if you didn't give them a raise of 8%, they are taking a pay cut uh, in your organization. That, that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an effective pay cut. It's not an actual pay cut, but it's an effective pay cut that they've taken. And they can go find 
you know, the increased wages outside of your organization. So you got to understand the wage sensitivity um, and, and understand that if you're going to kind of keep wages consistent with pre-inflation numbers, then you understand the, the results of that and the possible consequences. Uh, we talked about building connection and belonging. That's a critical thing for you to focus on. What is belonging in your organization? How do we increase care and voice um, and opportunity for, for people in your organization? That's a critical thing. And the Evaluating the employee value per proposition, just what we talked about. Understand what is your value proposition, what are the reasons for people to stay or to be attracted to your organization, and then uh, have the mechanisms in place to identify if we have some toxic policies that are, that are just causing people to walk out the door. Same thing true for toxic managers. Are the managers we have that are just driving people away? We can't have that anymore. We need to be able to retain people. We can't have, we can't lose people just because we have, you know, something bad happening in the organization that shouldn't otherwise be there. So we want to keep that in mind as well. That's great, Dave. And when we just came up on our, our time limit here, we appreciate everyone attending uh, this session today. And again, the slides will be available in the recording uh, that you can find on Bright Talk. And we will be sending out an email to all the attendees with the codes for HR, CI, and SHRM uh, ongoing uh, learning credits. Uh, thanks again, and thanks, Dave, for your contribution here today. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.